In this video, we will try to determine what all 2x2 two two orthogonal matrices essentially look like. And we will discover that there isn't much freedom at all, that all 2x2 two two orthogonal matrices essentially look like the standard rotation matrix with one basic caveat. Now we already know that this definition implies that the columns of Q are orthonormal in the sense of the algebraic dot product. But let us actually work directly from this definition and rediscover what that statement means. So we'll have a matrix Q with unknown entries A, B, C, and D. So this will be Q, this will be Q transpose. Of course, their product equals the identity matrix. And what we're going to do now is determine the relationships that A, B, C, and D must satisfy in order for this identity to hold. And you will see that we have four unknowns we'll have three equations, three equations with four unknowns. A little bit of freedom, but only basically one degree of freedom. So you'll see what happens. So if this is Q, and this is Q transpose, then Q transpose is A, B, C, D across. Its rows are the same as the columns of Q. So A, B, C, D. We're treating these as our unknowns, so let's determine the relationships they must satisfy. So where does this one come from? This one is the dot product of this row and this column. So we have a squared plus b squared equals one. Let's write it down. a squared plus b squared equals one. And of course, this is the algebraic statement of the fact that this column is unit length. In other words, more precisely, the vector that this column represents with respect to this basis is one. All right, now let's look at this one. Where does this one come from? Well, it's the dot product of this row and this column. And that tells us that c squared plus d squared also equals one. Let's write that down. c squared plus d squared equals one. And I'll just say without clarifying it that this is the statement that the length of the second column is one. Now where does this zero come from? Well, the zero is the dot product of these two elements. So AC plus BD equals zero. AC plus BD equals zero. And you might think that there is one additional condition coming from this zero. Well, let's see what it is. It comes from this row and this column. AC plus BD equals zero. So that's always the case when you multiply a matrix by its transpose. You get a symmetric matrix always. So whatever is in the lower half, that's what you get in the upper half. So there isn't any additional information. It's the same relationship as this. And this uh, relationship is, of course, a manifestation of the fact that the columns of Q are orthogonal. In other words, the vectors that the columns of Q represent with respect to this basis are orthogonal. So these are the three conditions that we have. Four unknowns, three conditions, one degree of freedom. So let's see what could possibly go into this matrix Q. So in the first column, we're looking at two numbers whose squares add up to one. And of course, we immediately remember this trig identity cosine alpha, cosine, excuse me, squared alpha plus sine squared alpha equals one. For any angle whatsoever, the sum of the square of the cosine and the square of the sine is always one. That's sort of a signature identity from trigonometry. But the converse is also true. Whenever you have two numbers whose squares add up to one, there always exists an angle whose cosine equals a and whose sine equals b, whose cosine equals a and sine equals b. Whatever a is, it must be less than one. There are two angles whose cosine equals a. I don't necessarily want to draw the unit circle. You can do it on your own and work out the details. So there will be two angles whose cosine equals a, an angle and minus that angle, and B will then nail which one of the two angles you have to take. So there's a unique angle, especially if you limit yourself 
to going from 0 to 2 pi. So there is a single angle whose cosine equals a and whose sine equals b. That is true whenever you have two numbers whose squares add up to 1. So pick that angle, call it alpha. And then we know that what goes here must be cosine alpha and sine alpha. I actually won't write the angle, just keep it simple. So cosine alpha, sine alpha. Now you might say, well, how do you know that A is the cosine and B is the sine? Couldn't A be the sine and B be the cosine? Yes, it can. So there is a little bit of arbitrariness. There is a different angle whose sine is A and cosine is B. It's actually pi over 2 or 90 degrees minus the alpha that would have gone here. So there is a little bit of arbitrariness. It's totally up to you which one you go with. I'm going to go with the angle such that its cosine is A and sine is B. And that's what we have here. Now, what could go here? Well, from this identity right here, we know that it's two more numbers whose square is at up to one. So it's the cosine and sine of another angle. Okay, that's one way of looking at it. That's almost there. But we, not, we must also pick a column that's orthogonal to the first column. And remember, I'm going to step back a little bit, how we do that, and that's really the only way of doing it. Now for a moment, forget about the two numbers adding up to one. Suppose we have two numbers here, one and two, and we need to pick a second column that's orthogonal to the first. The way we do it is by putting a two here, a one here, and a minus sign in front of one of them. Now we have two columns that are orthogonal. We'll worry about these identities later. Right now we're just trying to figure out this one. Okay, that's one way of doing it. But the minus sign is arbitrary, so it could have also gone here. So that these are really, this is really the only way to come up with an orthogonal vector. Switch the two numbers and put a minus sign in front of one of the two numbers. Another thing that, another freedom that you have is to multiply this column by any number. For example, we can multiply it by 10. Okay, so now let's take this idea and carry it over here. So the only way to obtain a column that's orthogonal to this one is switch these two and put a minus sign in front of one of them. Right? Can you also multiply it by some number? Well, no, you can't because the squares of these numbers need to add up to 1. So if this was 1 over square root of 2 and this was 1 over square root of 2, not the greatest example because they're the same, but if you switch them, put a minus sign in front of one of them and then multiply them by 10, the sums of squares would add up not to 1 but to 100. So all we can really do is switch the numbers, put the minus sign in front of one of them, but we can't really do this multiplication by any number. So switch them around and put the minus sign in front of one of them. So the minus sign could go here or the minus sign could go here. Okay, two possibilities. And that's why I said that it will be necessarily the standard rotation matrix with one caveat. That's the caveat, where the minus sign goes. So if we put the minus sign right here, this would be the standard rotation matrix and its determinant would be cosine squared plus sine squared. Its determinant would be 1. So that would be the case where we have the standard rotation matrix. That's one thing that an orthogonal 2 by 2 matrix can be. The other thing comes from putting the minus sign in the alternative location. And this is not the standard rotation matrix. In fact, this is not a rotation. This is a rotation with something else added to it, with another little kink. Why do I know that this is not a rotation? Because the determinant of a rotation matrix is always 1. We discovered that. And the determinant of this matrix is minus cosine squared minus sine squared. It's minus 1. So this is not a rotation matrix. As I will show you in a moment, this is a rotation matrix with a flip. Because this matrix can be written the following way. I'm looking for space. I'm going to erase this work 
and write down what this matrix looks like. Okay, here is one way to represent this matrix, which is not quite a rotation matrix. It's, a ro it's almost a standard rotation matrix with a minus sign in front of this entry as opposed to this entry. And the determinant of this entry is minus, the determinant of this matrix is minus one, so it's not really a rotation matrix. But look what I did. I did the ob an obvious thing. I represented it as a product of a rotation matrix times this diagonal matrix. If you think of this matrix as an elementary matrix acting upon this one, then what it does is multiply the second column by negative one. So this product is indeed this matrix. And we can think of, we can think of these two matrices as representing actions. What this one is, is reflection with respect to the x-axis. Now I'm talking strictly in terms of this orthogonal basis. But reflection with respect to this straight line, let's call it the horizontal straight line, simply flips the y component of the vector for any vector. And that's what this matrix does. It will flip the y component of the vector. Okay, so this is a simple reflection followed by a rotation. So this length-preserving transformation, in other words, an orthogonal matrix, can be represented as a rotation and a reflection, or as a reflection followed by a rotation. It can also be done in the opposite order, but with, a little, with slightly different numbers that I'll save as an exercise. But here we go. We have discovered what all orthogonal 2 by 2 matrices look like. And what they look like is either a straight up standard rotation matrix or a rotation matrix with a flip, with a reflection.